take your seats and stuff. But everybody stand up, shake your arms out a little. We got one last panel. We've got some very impressive executives at some of the largest companies in the world that we all touch their products and services. Um, so really excited to kind of have everybody with us today um, to really understand how they're using AI in their businesses to create incredible customer experiences, to create incredible efficiency in their business, uh, and also to touch all of their customers. Um, to my left here is Angela Moreno, uh, VP of AI from Southwest Airlines. Southwest has been at the forefront of integrating AI to streamline operations and provide exceptional customer experience. And today she's really going to share some insights, which I know everybody in this room is kind of thinking, where do I start with AI? How do I bring it into our business and kind of get leadership buy-in? Um, next to her is Jeff Perkins, VP of Global Demand Generation uh, at Blackhawk. Blackhawk has been leveraging AI to revolutionize the digital payments sector, really transforming the way that everybody engages with incentives, rewards, and loyalty. Uh, next to Jeff is George Sitter, SVP of Account Management from MasterCard. MasterCard has been utilizing AI to enhance security and fraud protection, which saves all of us you know, dearly. I know I get those calls when there's an unwarranted charge. George is going to share more about that in a moment. Uh, next to George is Michael Ehrman, one of the founders of Halo. Halo has been revolutionizing the boundaries of innovation in the IoT space and really in also how they're engaging their customers. And last, but certainly not least, is Roger Ahadi, VP and Global Head of Design from BP. And Roger's done an incredible job of integrating AI into their creative process, is going to share more. So please, everybody, sit. And Angela, if you don't mind starting, just tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, yes, so I work for Southwest Airlines, um, and I didn't realize I was going to be um, and a crowd of so many people from outside of the U.S. So just uh, so that you're familiar with Southwest Airlines, we're employees of about 80,000 80, employees. Um, so pretty big company, and um, I've been there over 25 years now, which is kind of hard to believe, but um, it's a place that people come and they usually stay for, for quite some time. So I started out uh, working with our data, Enterprise Data Warehouse group, and uh, I've just kind of made my way through a couple of different roles, but always dealing with data, always thinking about how we can improve our business processes, ultimately to improve our employee experience, uh, as well as our customer experience, uh, just overall at Southwest. Awesome. Jeff, if you could share a little about yourself. All right, thanks. You know, before I start, I just have to say, Roger, I think between last night and tonight, you, are, you win the fashion award. <laughs> Looking good. Well done. Um, so, uh, Jeff Perkins, I'm the VP of Demand Gen at Black Hawk Network, and basically my team and I are responsible for driving growth, driving, um, leveraging our assets to uh, ultimately drive more revenue for the organization. And, um, you know, as uh, Gary mentioned, Black Hawk Network is a, is a leader and a global provider of gift cards, of incentive programs, payments, and uh, really support tens of thousands of businesses globally. Um, with their programs. And um, so I've been there for about a year and a half, and uh, prior to that, um, my um, background has been in other leading companies like um, Western Union, uh, Verizon, um, Legis Group, um, and uh, you know, leading various marketing roles within those organizations. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, I'm George Sider, uh, Senior Vice President of Account Management at MasterCard. I lead a team of account managers that supports customers in the fintech, prepaid, um, and I would say non-traditional uh, financial institution space. Uh, Blackhawk is actually one of our uh, primary or, or main customers that we support in the U.S. market. I've uh, been with MasterCard for about six years, leading the account management function, uh, but have been in the payments, technology, and financial inclusion space for the last 20 years. And uh, you know, one of the things I always remind folks is that although MasterCard is a worldwide brand and, and well-known, we are actually not a direct-to-consumer company, which I know sounds kind of funny. We are a B2B2C company, so we only succeed when our partners and our FIs do. 
And uh, so that's a lot of how we are motivated and how we operate on a daily basis. And I uh, just wanted to thank Gary and the team for having us here today. So looking Pleasure. forward to the conversation. Thank you. Yeah, my name is uh, <coughs> Michael Ehrman. And as Gary said, I'm one of the co-founders of Halo. We're actually in the pet tech space. How many of you guys have dogs? Anyone have a dog? If you do, raise your hand. Good. There's at least three of you. So <laughs> actually, in the United States, about 60% of households have dogs. And at least here, they're kind of treated like family. Halo is all about creating, using technology, your dog wears, and an app to really revolutionize the way you communicate with your dog, not only getting data from your dog, but communicating back to your dog, both directly through the phone, but also automatically to keep your dog safe, let it thrive, have a, the life that everyone wants their dog to have, knowing that you can have a, you know, really a safe dog, but one that really gets to be both, uh, while being safe and not being lost or, or running away, also living a, the life that a dog is, deserves to live. Awesome. Um, I'm, a, I'm a dog lover, so <laughs> that's great. Um, yeah, so my name is Roger Rohatke. I'm the Vice President and Global Head of Design, and it's great to be here. Uh, thank you, Gary, and everybody, um, and, uh, and all the panelists. I uh, uh, have been in the design space as it relates to user experience and digital, um, and kind of the, my career in creative over the last 25 plus years in uh, television and film, wrote an international film that won an uh, um, award and uh, helped launch social television in the United States with people like Mark Burnett who created Survivor and The Voice and those shows. And some of the designs that I created back then when we were doing interactive TV and things and social ended up going into an app called Vine uh, that um, was kind of a precursor to TikTok. And so I don't know whether to apologize for that or to uh, take credit for that. So anyway, uh, but I'm sorry. Um, and uh, so things Things have evolved since then. Uh, my career uh, continued to evolve through digital and led global design at companies like Motorola and others. But at, uh, in 2019, BP reached out to me, my company, um, which was formerly called British Petroleum, reached out to me at the end of 2019 and uh, on LinkedIn. And uh, I made the transition there. They said, hey, are you... Uh, are you open to coming over here? And I said, well, what, what would you need somebody like me for? And they said, we're going through a massive digital transformation. And they had robots going up walls and through pipes and underwater and fleets of drones and AR, XR, MR, VR, AI, all this cool technology. But the question I had was, how are you putting humans at the center of the equation? How are you designing experiences based upon how you're listening and for your customers internally and externally? And they didn't have a great answer for that and they said they need help. So I joined as the first design leader in their 100 year history. Uh, as it relates to user experience, and I've been building out that practice since, and now oversee uh, design that accounts for over 200,000 interfaces across the globe, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of apps, and uh, thousands of designs with many designers all over the world. So it's been an exciting journey, uh, to say the least, and also leading the efforts around design and AI in the company, design and metaverse in the company, with our partnership with Microsoft and Microsoft Mesh as one of their rollout partners, uh, as well as other uh, initiatives that we have in the company as it relates to better experiences, not only for people, uh, but for our planet. Awesome. So George, if you don't mind getting the mic, tell us a little bit about how MasterCard is leveraging AI and kind of how they've embraced it maybe and they're looking at it this year versus a few years ago and, and where you see it going. Yeah, sure. I, you know, I think, um, and as any, I think, large corporation would admit, you know, we, we've all kind of figured out how to adapt and, and figure out what AI means to our organization. I think for us, internally, for our 35,000 plus employees, it serves a number of different roles. Um, for career opportunities, we have a platform called Unlocked, where we can leverage AI based on what you input in and what your current role is to figure out what you maybe want to do next at MasterCard. We have a lot of folks that kind of rotate through in different functional areas, and AI actually powers that Unlocked platform. We also use it for health and wellness, to monitor the health and wellness of employees. We use it for um, you know, workflow and also for productivity, and also to figure out how to optimize and employ our over 35,000 resources in the best possible way. Uh, you, know, you can't tackle everything, so you have to be you know, pretty laser focused. And for us, internally, I think that AI is really an exercise in optimization. Um, externally, uh, we use it in a number of different ways. And again, it's very driven through our partners, through our financial institutions, our program managers, 
and a lot of our fintech partners. We use it to innovate and figure out how to scale and help them grow their portfolios. But more importantly, we figure out a way uh, to work really closely with them to understand how to protect their ecosystem and more importantly, their cardholders. So we have a number of cyber and intelligence tools that we've developed over the years. Uh, a lot of them are, and I'll talk more about this a little bit later, are, a lot of them are powered by AI. Uh, some of those uh, are uh, companies that we've acquired over the years, but the central theme is that we figured out a way to build a more robust and secure ecosystem for our partners while leveraging uh, the best available tools. So I think I read recently that uh, about a new product that you guys had developed, Scam Protect, um, and powering different technologies for kind of fraud protection. Can you share a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So we actually just announced it. Um, you know, just in the U.S. alone, uh, there is like 23 billion annually that, uh, you know, from a scam pr uh, perspective is actually happening in the U.S. If you look globally, it's 486 billion that is actually um, at risk. And so we developed something called Scam Protect, and it's based on four principles. Uh, the first principle is biometrics. So whether it's your thumbprint or it is your facial scan, we are leveraging the latest technology to ensure that who's ever performing the transaction is the, the right person. Um, we're also looking at identity. So, and it's beyond traditional identity. It's really about um, am I who I say I am and am I transacting on a device that is supposed to be my own? And then what we use, do from there is we're using transaction intelligence. So we have transaction data on cardholders. We understand their behavior, where they spend, when they spend, and we work with our partners to set up thresholds, to set up metrics. Um, you know, we have tools like Decision Intelligence and Fraud Rules Manager that help understand that behavior so they can better predict um, how, how to stop that from any kind of fraudulent activity from occurring. And then finally, we're leveraging open banking. Uh, we acquired a company called Finicity about three years ago, and we use open banking to actually validate accounts. You know, one of the biggest areas of fraud is actually money movement or peer-to-peer -peer, uh, transfers. And so some of those stats that I gave you, a significant majority of that is happening just in, in the, the, uh, the area of money movement and how we can secure that, that flow um, and avoid some of the fraud that uh, has occurred in the past. Awesome, thank you. And Jeff, I know Blackhawk is a big partner with MasterCard. Maybe share a little bit about how you guys are leveraging AI. Yeah, sure. I mean, one of the things uh, that George mentioned is around fraud prevention. That's a huge area for us as well, as you can imagine. People like our products. Uh, they like gift cards. They like to steal them. They like to use, um, you know, things that uh, are not theirs. And so we, that, that's a big area that we've um, invested in, and we, we really are one of the leaders in fraud prevention from a gift card standpoint if you look at others in our industry. Um, there's multiple other areas where we use AI, um, whether it's you know, typical things that you would think of like you know, chat bots and things like that for our sales and service teams. I'm going to um, touch on a couple uh, other specific areas. You know, a lot of, as I listened to a lot of the panelists from earlier, a lot was shared around homegrown solutions that I think are fantastic and are really inspiring. Uh, to see the technology and see the evolution and how fast and rapidly it's growing. Um, the other way that I think is really important to leverage AI, and particularly as David talked about with how hard change can be and how important it is for organizations to change, is to leverage those who are experts in their field and who have developed amazing technology and to be able to integrate that into your business. Um, and that's really where you know we've tried to make a lot of inroads is is, is really to look at what are the things that I would say kind of within two areas, at least from my standpoint within the marketing area. One is where are there areas that we can really drive better decisioning? How can we improve the way that we either make decisions to um, uh, you know, ultimately improve the customer experience, better decisions that are gonna drive you know, better business? Um, and the second way is around efficiency and how do we uh, really improve efficiency in, in what we do and, and how we operate? A couple examples around those. Um, first is around content. So we had a challenge with a fairly small content team that uh, would write all of our global content. Um, they would do it for a website or emails and everything else. And um, two, two issues. One is just the bottleneck of being able to get through the volume of content that we need. The second is you know, being able to have the relevance of you know, all the SEO um, characteristics that you need to drive, you know, business. And third is an ever-growing need, and, and one of the things that I'm passionate about is being able to drive a greater level of personalization and 
that requires a lot more, you know, uh, very specific and um, very intense, you know, uh, creation of content. And uh, it's one of the one of the reasons why we partnered with Edgy was being able to bring in some of the capabilities that they have related to content creation and particularly around SEO. Um, and you know we're making our teams um, more efficient with being able to produce a lot more and again being able to provide a better experience through that customization that we can provide to customers. Um, the other thing is being able to make smarter decisions and so we have uh, another party that we, another uh, platform that we've integrated that allows us to use a lot of uh, propensity modeling and decisioning to understand who are the customers that would benefit most and would be most interested and are showing signs of intent that we can go after to help drive greater adoption of our processes or our services that we can uh, provide to them. Uh, so those are a couple examples. Awesome. A Angela, I I'm a huge fan of Southwest. My home is Dallas. Awesome. So uh, definitely the hub for Southwest. You know, one of the big things that everybody in this room is really thinking about contemplating is how do you get started? How do you, there's so much excitement about AI. We've heard incredible use cases, applications, but how do you navigate it inside a company the size of Southwest? How do you start, get leadership buy-in to get movement uh, to start testing and trying some of these things? Yeah, well, like I said, I've been there a long time. <laughs> so I do know uh, quite a few people around the building. So um, what I've done is just tried to kind of tap into those relationships. Um, but I will say, you know, I guess about a year ago when ChatGPT exploded onto the scene, our CEO was like, we need to be doing AI. And I'm kind of like, hey, we've been doing AI for a little while now. Um, so I've almost seen AI is a little bit of a Trojan horse. Um, and what I mean by that is people are excited about it. And so it's now really uh, much easier to go have a conversation around how our tools, and it's not just generative AI, because I have uh, traditional AI capabilities on our team, automation, just how do we use data? How do we just think about process uh, improvement and process simplification? So leveraging AI, you can just very easily go in to have a conversation around how can I help you uh, improve your business and whether that's for the employee experience, whether it's for efficiency or for the customer experience, kind of like what Roger was talking about. Um, our approach is to really understand what is that end-to-end -end process? Um, so one of the very first generative AI capabilities um, that we've stood up and opportunities that we've pursued um, is in our customer engagement group. So really think of it as customer relations. So if you've flown, um, if your Wi-Fi didn't work, you want a refund, you want a refund on your flight, whatever that might be, you can submit a form on southwest.com, uh, submit your complaint, and that goes to this customer engagement group. So what we did was we, um, we looked at that entire end-to-end -end process, both from an employee perspective as well as the customer perspective. We didn't just drop in a generative AI solution. We really looked at that entire end-to-end -end process, and we looked at the pain points that were a part of that, uh, and we contemplated for every part of that journey, how could we improve that, uh, again, through generative AI, traditional AI, data, process simplification, and through that, we've been able to drive um, about a 50% improvement in uh, capacity for that team. And then leaders can choose what they want to do with that capacity, whether that's do more uh, with the same amount of people or other opportunities for us to reduce cost, um, you know, again, just depending on what that leader uh, is ultimately wanting to do. So I think it's leveraging relationships, uh, focusing on value, not just the solution and what it can do, because, you know, you can have a tool and, and implement it, but if it doesn't create value for the company, um, then it's not really a whole lot of good. So that's been our approach so far. Definitely agree. Thank you. Uh, Michael. Uh, I'm a huge dog lover, uh, two dogs, uh, and one of them I take almost everywhere. It's amazing she's not here with us today. <laughs> but tell us a little more about Halo, and you guys are doing some really awesome things when it comes to AI for your customers and your product. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, abso <clears throat> absolutely. So first of all, a little bit more, we're a IoT product company 
I would say we've been on the market, product's been on the market only three and a half years, so a very young company, kind of still, I would call it in startup mode. We have only 25, 30 employees, um, but we've been growing very rapidly. We built a great brand. And we really have three major areas. We're focused on the product, and the product has to be unbelievable, best in class, something any, no one's ever seen before, and we're very proud of that. And that's really the core of the business is the product, which is both you know, a collar, an app, uh, again, unlike anything that's ever existed for animals, for sure. Um, but also, we have customers. It's direct to consumer. So we've got unbelievable customers. We've got a lot of them. We need to service those customers. We need to give the right answers. This is a technology that you know, they've never used before, but even our customer service agents, you know, they have to learn it. Um, so that's a huge part of our business is great customer service. And then, of course, we're selling direct to consumer. So sales and marketing is all... Uh, you know, it's all e-commerce platform and bringing people to the website and converting them. So we use AI in all three areas. Um, it's critical because you can't have a company to, that you could scale at a reasonable cost without, you know, using the technology that's available, best-in-class technology, to grow without hiring, you know, thousands of employees. And we are not ready to do that. But uh, my, my pride is really the, the work we put into the product itself, using AI in the product. Um, one of the main areas we're doing it, this, and this is again an IoT product, is getting all this data, real time, streaming in from sensors in this product that's attached to your dog, and w among the other things that it will do is keep track of actually, we'll use pattern recognition, behavioral analysis, and determine exactly what your dog's doing everywhere it goes, combine that with the information it knows about where your dog is, so now it knows what your dog's doing, where your dog's going, and communicate that information back to you in real time, and it's really revolutionary, um, the number of things that can be done. And then another thing a Halo will do is communicate back to your dog. So it lets you communicate back to your dog, but it will communicate back to your dog automatically. So for example, it determines your dog is uh, going to the bathroom. You don't want your dog going to the bathroom some part of your house or outside in the yard. The, you know, the product will communicate that for you automatically right there in real time. I know uh, many people AI. who need that. <laughs> yeah, so very common problem. Here's using AI and a technology to solve that kind of problem. So that's how we use it in a product. I'll talk about it a little bit later, how we use it for customer service, how we use it for sales and marketing. Yeah, thank you. Roger, I, I understand you were actually at Harvard last week talking and, and sharing things. Tell us a little bit about what you discussed last week. Yeah, so uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so, so it's interesting. Harvard has uh, an institute they've created called D Cubed. Um, and so it's uh, data, design, and digital. And uh, their organization that they've set up inside their company, uh, their organization, their, I guess their university, is focused on all the things we're talking about. And it's their um, new kind of like lab, if you will, for all these things in AI. So they had their AI summit. And uh, I felt very honored and privileged to be able to uh, be invited there to speak about AI and design and what we're doing and, um, and the partnership that we've actually had with them and some work that we've been doing alongside a group called Fantasy and ourselves and Harvard, we um, stepped out to do the first design AI driven sprint um, no, that we know of in the world that was documented and documented by a university like Harvard. Uh, it's, um, it's, I think it's uh, the first case that will be taught on generative AI in Harvard Business School. Um, on, on, and, and as it relates to this um, and design. So very exciting that that, that happened. But uh, one of the things that we were looking at and uh, in our company, what, we, what we've been thinking about, obviously AI has been in our, um, we've been using that in our company since um, maybe six years ago or earlier. And there's all sorts of, kind of different applications we can use that for. And if you can imagine the size of our company across the globe, it's B2B, it's B2C, it's what I call B2G, which is like business to governments, helping whole cities become sustainable or smart. You have B2E, which is all the enterprise software internally and externally, and B2Me, which is all the employee experience. And uh, you can imagine all the apps across that. So we're designing for fleet drivers and different businesses to consumers and retail. We own a coffee company called Wild Bean Coffee, of all things. Uh, we, um, we're designing for EV charging and wind farms, solar fields, and then all the way to people out on assets and rigs and in the ocean and airfield automation, traders, finance groups, procurement, you name it, right? And then there's all the employee experience as well. And across all that, AI can be applied to all of those things. And so when you look at some of the things that we do out in our assets, out in the ocean, or, or even in our refineries, we've um, uh, been working with digital twins for a while. Uh, but what we started thinking about is how can we actually create 
um, better ways to understand our customers and really get to know um, uh, our customers better. And a lot of times we can't get out to those uh, places and those remote places or we can't always speak to our customers all the time. So how can you get to customers um, and, and get the feedback you need and, and really get the um, uh, endless type of conversations that we need to be having um, and not be able to get there? And so we created uh, digital uh, twins of our customers called Synthetic Humans. And those synthetic humans are ones where we fed lots of data into and uh, different parts of the modeling and, and, and uh, over 100 plus different types of distinctive traits that we can interact with them and, and, um, and then uh, work with them through the concepts that we wanted to ask them about uh, around our business or uh, things that we're looking at around smart cities and, and uh, a lot of things that we're doing in convenience and, and mobility. And uh, the, the, the results were astounding. And what we've been able to, to achieve and what we've been able to unlock and to augment with our ability with AI has been um, really a, just the beginning of where we want to head with, uh, with how we can understand our customers at a deeper level, but also with humans in the loop and having human validation and being able to um, make sure that our teams are working as human machine teams uh, to be able to pull this off. And uh, so it's really opened up uh, an incredible amount of um, uh, ideation for us and, and levels of, of thought that we um, were able to go even beyond AI in actually. Awesome, thank you. George, I, I wanted to touch on something you mentioned a little earlier. I know we're in a very challenging kind of fraud environment. I think that around $12.5 billion was lost by Americans last year uh, in 2023 in internet scams. I'm always personally like shocked, like as soon as there's a weird looking charge, off pattern, like I get a text or a call. Tell us a little bit more about some of the things that you guys are developing in that realm to kind of protect all of our bank accounts. Yeah, absolutely, Gary. So Scam Protect is an example of something we developed in direct response to that. There's what we call authorized and then unauthorized scams. So there's the authorized scams where someone actually thinks they're doing a legitimate transaction or making a legitimate donation, and they're not. You know, so there's that, and then there's obviously the unauthorized, which is more like an account takeover. Um, what we're doing, again, is, is kind of leveraging those pillars around biometrics and identity, um, our transaction intelligence, and then open banking to have a holistic view of that cardholder to ensure that we can prevent that. And not only do we want to prevent it, but we want to prevent it in real time. So I think that's the key. You know, you, you go through what we call or what's known in the industry as the, the chargeback process after the fact to recover your funds. Chargebacks are expensive, not only to the issuer, but to the cardholder. And they take time to settle. They can be a month, two months, sometimes three months. What we're trying to do is prevent those transactions, those fraudulent transactions from occurring real time so that there is not a chargeback process. It's stopped there. You get a notification in your mobile app from your bank that essentially says we stopped this suspicious behavior. I had something recently. Uh, I have a city card through um, a MasterCard, obviously, and I, I got a text message at 12.30 uh, in the morning that basically said uh, there were nine Facebook transactions that were attempted in your account. I'm not on Facebook. Sorry, I'm not. I don't really do Facebook. Uh, some other stuff, but not Facebook. Um, I knew that wasn't me, and I. But I did not have to go through a chargeback process. I did not have to file anything. I simply had to acknowledge that I didn't attempt those transactions at 12:30 at night. So I think it's that real-time fraud prevention that we're trying to get to, so that we're not in recovery mode. We're being more proactive. I think that's awesome, um, Angela. You talked a little bit earlier about getting leadership buy-in. Let's go to the other thing that so many people in this room are really kind of facing and struggling with and trying to navigate, funding. How do you navigate the funding aspect once you've got the buy-in to kind of test some of these things out and implement them? Yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting because um, we don't, I don't actually report into our technology organization. We partner with them, but my team sits outside of technology. So I feel like me coming by funding is a little bit harder than our technology organization. Um, and so, like I mentioned earlier, um, we really try to tie everything that we do to value. Um, and sometimes I feel like it's a, it's a little unfair, but I kind of enjoy the challenge of um, the way that we've kind of worked through the funding is let me uh, provide to you not only what the value will be or what we estimate that value to be, but to actually partner with um, the business leader. I, I mentioned one earlier with our customer engagement team. Um, that leader was willing to sign up for the value that we were estimating uh, in terms of like actually taking out of his plan for the following year. 
So it puts a lot of pressure on, and it's it's definitely, um, you know, there's some risk involved there to sign up for that value, but it definitely, um, you know, allows us to create more confidence in the work that we're doing when a leader will actually sign up for, you know, literally cashing the check. Um, you know, we just recently went and asked for some more funding to go do um, another project, and our CFO was asking, like, well, how do you, how are you going to actually prove that, you know, the savings that you're, you're talking about here? Because you could end up in a situation where, like, well, you, you saved it, but it wasn't like a literal person. You saved a little bit of time here and a little bit of time there. So how do you actually, um, you know, take that out and truly cash that check? So we're kind of in the early days of that, um, but we're really just doing our very best to make sure that we tell that story. Um, and it's not just a, you know, a business case, like we've actually, you know, like I mentioned earlier, done that kind of end-to-end -end study and we've really identified where the pain points are. We're doing a lot more to truly capture um, what that value is, to really understand how long does it take somebody to do something today, whether that's a customer or an employee. And with these new solutions or whatever the AI is or the um, automation or traditional generative AI, whatever the solution is, we can really articulate the true time savings or the true impact of the customer experience or in some cases, you know, our operational resilience and how we recover, really putting value on those so that we can give confidence that uh, we're not just doing these things to, you know, to kind of have fun and, and to play around with. Yeah, no, I think that's so important. And as we've heard today, kind of test and learn and iterate uh, and kind of do it rapidly. Jeff, I wanted to hand it over to you and just kind of, as we're kind of trying to make a lot of these practical, I mean, how do you, how do you navigate where businesses should kind of start and where they would start to look at leveraging AI? Yeah, I mean, I think in your question, the first part is start, right? I mean, and so for those that maybe haven't really, you know, embarked down the path, I mean, it's obviously there's elements of AI that have been around for a, a long time, but uh, it's, it's just had such a tremendous um, acceleration in the last 18 months. But I, I, I would say even in the examples that I gave before, being able to identify where are there are areas where you can improve your decisioning, improve your efficiency, improve your customer experience. There's a ton of great um, products and applications that many companies have. And being able to start with identifying what the issue, what the, what the um, area that you would, you would think would be kind of the highest in priority. And then, you know, very simply researching where the, you know, solutions that are out there. There's so many things that are out there. And then, like Angela, you were talking about, you know, I think once you start with one and you can prove that in and you can show the value, you have the right KPIs and measurement, um, you know, measurements in place, that really opens up the door to accelerate rapidly into other areas because you can show the value to the organization. Yeah. M Michael, I know you guys have done a really uh, interesting job of leveraging AI in kind of your customer interaction. Can you share a little bit more about some of the things you guys have done? Sure. Um, as I mentioned earlier, customer, I mean, direct to consumer, so you get a lot of crazy questions from amazing, amazing customers. Um, you don't know what they're going to ask or how they're going to ask it, and you want to give them the right answer, and you want to give it immediately, and you, you know, some of the times those questions the answers are the same over and over again. Maybe 80, 90% of the time they're getting, you know, the right, as long as they get the right answer, it's always the same questions coming in over and over, maybe asked differently. So using AI to, for those kind of purposes, I think it's a huge opportunity for efficiency for a business like ours. That's why we're, we're using it in that way. Um, there's no reason why that needs to be fielded by a human being. So it, but it does need natural language processing, it does need someone who understands what the person's really trying to understand and then has access to all the results and all the right information. So you can have a quick and easy transaction um, without a person needing to be in the middle. But we also are a very strong believer that you do need people um, as part of this, part of the process, especially in customer service. So we have this uh, really amazing customer service solution that's really uh, for when you need to go beyond that we offer a face-to-face, -face, like live, interactive customer service instant uh, through your phone, through your app. Um, that's really revolutionary, especially in our business. So it's important to have this combination, this kind of hybrid, where you can get the right answers most of the time with automation, with AI, something that's very scalable. But when you need 
something, something's unusual, maybe there's something going on with your dog, it's not something an AI is going to answer. So you do need a person, and when you do deliver the, the person to the customer, you want it to be something that you know, blows them away. They're like, this is something I've never had uh, before, and it really changes the nature of your relationship with your customer, which is really what drives your business, of course, at the end of the day. Awesome. I know you guys have constantly been innovating. Tell us about some of the things that you maybe have in the works in the future. Oh, that, well, we are, by the way, one thing I should say, I'm sure Gary would be happy to know, we are starting to work with Smith OS on automating a lot of other business processes that we do, a lot of repetitive business processes. Um, definitely a believer in that. Again, we want to scale, small company. We're growing very fast. We can't possibly uh, do all the things we need to do without automation and without orchestration. So you know, I listened intently when Alexander was going over uh, all the things Smith OS can do, and you know, we have great plans to take advantage of that. And yes, there are a lot of amazing things coming out. I would just recommend you can talk to me about it later at the game or take a look at uh, halocollar.com. I don't want to take too long. We're all wrapping up. So. Okay. Roger, I wanted to hand it over to you. Uh, I know you've... Um, been on the cutting edge of a lot of different things. Tell us kind of where you see AI moving in the future, kind of from your perspective. Well, that's a, that's a big question. I, don't, I, I think everybody has a different view of that. Um, I, uh, I guess I can share some personal thoughts and some of the stuff I'm talking about um, out there and in the, in, uh, some of the conversations I'm having and things I'm, I'm you know, d learning and discovering. Uh, I'm actually talking about it a little bit more this week at a conference I'm speaking at later in the week here in Boston, as well as um, some of the work I'm doing with uh, MIT and the stuff we're doing together. So I'll be there tomorrow as well uh, discussing some of this. But um, some of the things that I I've seen in, in, at least in design and user experience, um, and, and let me just ask a question. I mean, a lot of you are, I mean, are in tech or you're you know, connected to tech or whatever. Is everyone familiar with what UX is? Is that, I mean, sometimes in my company, I still have to explain that, right? UX, user experience, it's the actual design of how the usability of people using an app, right? So how do you, you know, how do people use that app, right? So that UX. And so user experience has been around for a long time, actually. One of the first user experience people was um, uh, Don Norman in Apple, and he coined the term, you know, uh, user experience professional back in the 90s at Apple. So it's been around for a long time. It's not just how great you can make a product uh, as aesthetic-wise, but it's how usable it can be, right? So I see that there is a potential that um, right now we've been looking at UX and even in our company I call it HX, which is human experience, which is UX plus CX plus EX, which it really comes, comes down to this, right? You can't have a really great customer experience if you don't have a really solid user experience. And you can't have a solid user experience if you don't have an authentic employee experience. And all of those are connected. And obviously Southwest is trying to get that right and doing a great job of that. I, I know that for sure. I've seen that and experienced it myself. And, and that human experience is important. But when you look at UX, UX is something that where you have um, humans doing research with other humans to design experiences for humans designed by humans. But UX is beginning to evolve. And you might see the future of something called AX, which is potentially artificial experience, where you have, instead of humans designing experiences for humans, you might have AI designing for what it thinks humans might want to experience based upon all the things that it thinks it's learning about. And so that AX is going to rise. And you might have things that begin to transition from product designers, and they might evolve, or things might evolve to prompt designers. And you might have uh, design thinking become artificial thinking and all sorts of kind of different things that are happening there. And it is an area that we're looking at because we want to augment our ability. And so it's, it's quite exciting. But one of the things I, I think, and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up with this thought, is, and, and these are my personal thoughts, is that when you look at uh, where we're going with um, even the digital twin technology I was talking about earlier about synthetic humans and things, um, imagine right today we are trying to look at how we have um, you know, synthetic humans or digital twins of our customers. Uh, so imagine like in the future though, what if I begin to have a digital twin of myself uh, or a digital you know, triplet of myself, right? Multiple versions of myself. So, you know, there's a Teams call I don't necessarily want to be on, but I can send a version of myself, not just to take notes. We work with Microsoft and Microsoft Copilot. We have that in our company. Thankfully, it's a great product. But, but imagine being able to interact and they're actually having, um, there's moments where I can actually answer questions 
as and my digital self will be answering that question on that call, right? And then imagine there are other th tasks in my life that I don't re necessarily want to do and I have a digital version of myself. And then as the metaverse continues to grow, if we continue to go that route, imagine in those areas or in those worlds, those virtual worlds, there's versions of myself there. So in those, each one of those, there's a different version of myself. It may have different needs and different wants, if you can imagine, or even different styles, uh, maybe even cooler jackets. But um, but the, and different brands would cater to that different version of yourself in all those different places. And you can imagine brands will start thinking about not just you for you, but you for all the different things that um, spawn out, off of you, I guess, if you will, uh, versions of yourself. And somebody mentioned earlier, what well, I thought it was really great, the panel previously about um, you know, job searching and, and job hunting. And imagine a world where it's not, you know, hi companies aren't just hiring you for you, but they're hiring you for all the different AI versions of yourself along with that, right? That you've trained off of your own DNA or digital or DNA, if you will. And so all these tasks that it can do. And so now it's hiring you and the army behind you, right? And so there's multiple versions of yourself. So that um, something in it, uh, that I've been looking at called, um, I've been calling it multipotentiality or uh, multipotentialites would have the ability to be able to have uh, the multipotentiality of doing uh, more than just one area of, of skill or, or uh, creative ability and or, or have more needs or wants than the, um, uh, than just one uh, singular need or want. And uh, so that, that's kind of where I see it going. Now, my wife is totally like, no, there's no, we don't need more versions of you. <laughs> it's a great, you know. Um, but, but, uh, but I do see that there could be a, a future, again, just personal thoughts, of where you begin to see this growing and you begin to see the multi-potentiality of the AI taking uh, us into places we've never been before. I mean, listen, a lot of companies in this room are looking at creating their own large language models on their data set. So you just be building your own. So listen, we're, we're up. I just wanted to thank this incredible group of panelists. I really do appreciate all the insights that you shared. I wanted to thank the Air Group for putting on this amazing event at Harvard. Uh, and uh, the future ahead is super exciting. Today we heard from so many innovative thinkers, innovative companies, and I think Alexander said it best. I mean, the future is in front of us and we all have the tools and technology to go build it. So everybody have a fantastic day. Thank you so much.